Welcome to the, the start of our you know, 45 minute Compass Community Chat today. Um, we are so thrilled to have you with us and we're gonna be letting people into the call for the next few minutes as we get started. I am so excited today to welcome you to our chat, which is going to be all about structuring community investigations for primary and middle school learners with the Compass. These Compass Community Chats are a chance for us our Compass Educator Network from around the world to come together informally and talk about sustainability, systems thinking, and the Compass tools and how we're using them to support teaching and learning. And Linda is with us today to share some of her experience and guide our conversation on this amazing topic. And we're so thrilled to have Linda with us because she has tons of experience doing this. Linda started off as a primary teacher in the UK and over time, as she moved to Thailand, has moved into the outdoor education realm and done so much work there. Um, I know for Compass, she's worked on the Barge program in Bangkok, and she's currently head of community at the Tridos Three Generational Community for Learning in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So we're thrilled to have her experience and her guiding our conversation today. And before we get started, just for those of you who perhaps need a quick recap or who may be new to Compass or are watching this later, uh, just a quick overview about who we are. Compass Education is a sustainability education nonprofit, and it's our mission to equip and empower educators and learners in learning communities around the world to use systems thinking to help build a more sustainable world. And the tool that we are extremely excited to be focused on today that we really love to share is a sustainability compass, which is a guide to navigating our way towards a more sustainable world with four conditions that we're trying to achieve, sustainable systems conditions, nature, economy, society, and well-being. So we'll explore that a little bit more throughout the chat today and feel free to ask any questions. But for the moment, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Linda Rell to start guiding our conversation. Ah, uh, thank you, Gitanjali. Nice. Uh, thank you for introducing me and thank you everybody for joining today. Um, as Kishanjali said, I work now in environmental education, so I often get uh, a class of kids come and I only get the chance to meet them for a day and often it's not even a day, you know, they, they roll up at half past eight, quarter to nine and three o'clock they're getting on their van and my mission with my team may be that we've had to investigate a community just in that time. So I'm going to try and share some of the ways that we, we quickly get children noticing um, about what's going on in communities through using Compass. But I'm interested, first of all, do you take your classes or your group or groups of children into communities? And what, what is the purpose of your visits into communities? Perhaps you'd like to enter in the chat or just share um, by unmuting yourself so that we, we can sort of see what experience we, we share as a group today. Ah, thank you very much to learn for their geography classes. Yes. So we get some of that. And I'm going to be talking today about um, a geography class that came looking at land use and uh, point and non-point pollution sources, middle schoolers. Um, we, I also will, will talk a little bit today about a group that was coming to compare uh, a distant or a different environment with their school or their home environment. We get that, that sort of group as well. Okay, so uh, Gitanjali, if I could have the first slide, please. We're a watershed program, Tritot Three Generation Barge Program, and we take students to different watershed sites. So one of the really fun programs is taking children along Chapraya River, the main river in Bangkok, and uh, riding a boat during the day and doing activities from the boat uh, for whatever theme the children have. So I'm going to share here about how Compass um, enriches an observational activity looking out of the boat. So obviously when you're on a boat and you're going along the river, you want to be looking out and seeing the riverside community that you're going by. And prior to really using Compass to structure the activity, um, we would give some guiding questions, ask the children to notice what was what sorts of boats or what was going on on the riverbank. Um, but with that sort of guidance, 
what if you were that student responding to the pictures that you can see now what are you able to see what would be your observations um, if you were doing river observation before we put the compass into the picture what do you see here as some of our river pictures I can see a fishing activity, uh -huh. a work fishing. I can see a construction work going on by the riverbank. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. I definitely also see a large golden Buddha <laughs> um, on the side, and I, I don't know what what it's from, but I see it. It's large. I think the lower right one is a is a. I've been on that boat. I think it's just a, like a water taxi. Uh, right, you're right. Just a little ferry going across. But these are sort of the random things that our groups look out of the boat and see. The, the barges carrying sand or mud um, from one end of the river to the other, often used in, in construction, the traditional fishermen. And then the, the chaos of the riverbank, houses on stilts, all juxtaposed to temples, fish farm, uh, riverbank reinforced with, with concrete. Men, those are the sorts of typical scenes. And before we used to use compass to guide us, they, those were the observations. Everybody would see the same thing. And when we came together to talk about it and debrief, it was a very low order thinking involved with the children feeding back pretty much it was just recall oh i saw a fisherman i saw a ferry boat um and then it was very teacher centered with the teacher the facilitator offering suggestions about well can you think why the there may be an impact from that barge carrying mud and it was all centered very much around the the teacher so if we can move to slide two we just tweaked our, our uh, journal notes a little bit by getting the children to choose one of the four lenses of the compass, nature, economy, society, or well-being, whatever they felt excited or interested in. And then pretty much the same river observation activity, but different children focused on what they're seeing through, through the lens of, of one point of the compass. So suddenly, the observation was, was taking place at a different level. A child with economy was saying, oh, yes, I've seen a boat carrying mud. That mud is to do with an industry or there's some sort of trade or business going on. But equally, the kid looking at um, nature was saying, oh, natural resources. Somewhere there's, na there's mud being dug up. It, it, the, the, along the riverbank somewhere, the, the natural resource is, is being harvested. And then the well-being kid, they're saying, oh dear, it's a bit noisy, that boat going along. I'm not sure I'd want to sit here on the riverbank having a cup of coffee with that ding going up and down all day. And then perhaps the society people say, oh look, there's jobs, people are working. Hmm, I wonder, is the tugboat pulling the barge? Own, is it all one family or is it how does that work? And different questions raising. Oh, I can see people living on that boat. Oh, do they live on it all the time? So they're immediately interacting through the question um, being posed through the lens of their, their compass. So after the children have done that for a while, um, then we stop and we group the kids into the four lenses. So all the economies observers, gather together as a group, all the society people gather as a group. And in their small group, and again, it doesn't use a lot of teacher interaction. It's quite, um, the children are pretty much running with it themselves. They have to come up with what they consider to be something very positive and something very negative that they have observed that connects to the lens of their compass. And if you move us to the next slide, um, please, you'll see that the children round their necks, they are wearing a, um, a, a label. And so in the group section, in the group time, they write their positive things or their negative things on these laminated cards that they subsequently wear around their neck. So that then 
um, enabled the groups, to the, the, the economy kids to talk together and to share their interpretation of things they had seen through the lens of economy. And then they sat, sit together in the four groups and we come together as a whole class. And you can see here, we've got um, vinyl colors. And so each part of the compass has these vinyl strips and they share what they consider to be their, their positive thing or the negative thing that they've identified. And then when we've gone round the circle sharing those things, we try to find connections. So um, the, 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 the well-being people say, oh, you know, the noise of the boats is really annoying. But economy says that boats are positive because it's, it's really supporting the economy. And so we run, we run the vinyl strip from the well-being person to the economy. Yes, yeah, Suji. Oh, sorry. Oh, I thought you said I, no problem. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, and so we try to make connections and it's very visual. Um, and again, it's, it's pretty much directed by the students themselves with fairly little facilitation needed from, from our staff. And then when we've made quite a few links through the circle, we try to see if there are any issues that connect to all the parts. And without really realizing, the students are actually starting to see some of the systems that are at work within, within river communities and the river system. And then we could ask them at the end, if once we found a few uh, systems that are going on, if you were the, the head man in, in this area of the river, and you had to implement one change, one innovation that would improve the sustainability of life along the river, what, cho what change would you make? What, what would you introduce? And nearly always the ch change that people make is the place in, in our circle that has the most connections. It's to do with the, the student holding the most pieces of colored vinyl. And they, they've realized without any formal discussion about it, um, of the, the importance of that node or, or that point of our connection circle. And they may say, oh, you know, I, we, we ban having boats between this time and that time, or, you know, we would um, put a rule that boats can't go faster than or whatever. So the children, again, are using what they have found and operating on quite a high level to realize the causes and consequences of making any change within that circle. So I feel that when we complete our river observation using Compass in this way in the first stage of the observation and then the small group discussion with like-minded people and then coming together as the whole group very quickly the students are able to appreciate that things aren't linear, that everything is interconnected and what somebody thought of as um, something that's very much economy based actually has an impact on well-being or society or, or the environment as well. Uh, are there any, any questions about middle schoolers using Compass in that way for their for an observation? I have if, a quick question. Yeah. yeah. When you do this, it sounds like you you let the understanding of systems just happen very organically and it's not explained. Is that accurate or is that something you include in the explanation or debrief when you tend to do this? So we don't in um, we don't talk about a system until we've already made links. And then we may be like, oh. Are there any links that connect all parts of our, of our uh, compass together? And the students are normally quite excited that they can make a link between all of the parts of the compass. And that's the point where we'll say, whoa, actually everything is connected. It's, it's a system. It's, it's everything is depending on everything else. And we might play with it. If we took, if we took away the, the, the barges carrying uh, mud, would that have any impact on any of the other parts? And we play with a few of those, or if we added more barges carrying mud, what impact would that have? So that we just check the understanding that children, uh, the students are realizing 
that there is a cause and a consequence and moving one thing out of this, this circle or this system is going to have an impact on changing other things. I feel when we're meeting children just for that short day, we have to choose what, what theory we're going to spend time teaching. Um, personally, I feel that it's important that when they're with us, they're looking out and they're processing what they're seeing. The theory can catch up pretty much at another time. But I do believe that they leave this activity thinking about, oh, everything's connected in, the river, in, in this system of the river. Mm. I have, I have a question. Please. Yes, Doris. All right. So what if you meet students that don't have any idea, any idea about this? You need to have an introductory class to them first to explain the nature, well-being, and the three points of the compact. Or you right. just leave it to them to do whatever they want to do. So it's, it's a good question. Thank you. It's very minimal. So when we start, we'll, we'll say, well, you know, where are we? We're on Chapraya River. Um, and we're going to look at the river from different angles. We're going to use something called the compass of sustainability. And perhaps we show a, a whiteboard with the, with the compass drawn where N represents nature, E, economy, society, well-being. Um, so what sort of things do you think we'd be looking at if we were looking at economy? And the children give us some ideas. What would we be looking at if we were looking at nature? And they'll give us some ideas because we're on the river and they're sort of thinking about water and issues to do with water and what's on the riverbank. So yes, and you can see on the um, on the slide the sort of uh, pyramid with society written on. On the back of those, you can see the green one and the blue one there. We have some key things that are in in each of the uh, sections of the compass. So it might say about people's jobs, people's work, trade, tourism will be noted on there. So we brainstormed quickly, but very quickly with the students and then asked them to select which, which area are you most interested in? And it's very unusual in a class that you don't get some people in everyone. And we don't get hung up if we've got more people in nature and we've got less people in well-being. As long as we've got somebody and perhaps the group that doesn't have very much, many people, one staff will pay attention to observe in that area as well. So it's, it's fast. OK, so you're, if you're the society people, here's our questions. Quick go through those. You're thinking looking at these things, thinking through the glasses of, of society. And these pure little, little um, prisms things, they're then put out. And if, if you want to just remind yourself, you can just have a look at the back of the prism for other things that you could be looking out for. Hmm. Okay, so that's uh, our getting to know a river community through uh, a river observation. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, uh, Getanjali. So the next slide is actually middle, the, the, the pictures may not be middle schoolers, but the activity I'm going to talk about is for middle schoolers. We had a group uh, around grade eight and they came to look at uh, land use. They, they asked us as the field trip provider to do a day on land use and point and non-point source pollution. So we decided to take the children to the river island of Gokbret, um, which is a small island. You can walk around it in about four hours. And you can see through the pictures here, the, the varying parts of that island. So it still has a small but active pottery community and they make the sorts of pots that you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. So the pots, um, they have a tradition that goes back to the 1700s when some migrants came and settled on that part and brought the trade of the, the skills of pottery and they've stayed on the island ever since. Today, they're pretty much used for tourist souvenirs. The other part of the island uh, is mostly farmland. Some walkways, as you can see in the top left, fruit trees, um, different vegetables being grown and then some some people as you can see in the top right starting to branch out into hydroponics 
and growing uh, shoots, sunflower shoots and things like that, which they sell. And oops, can we go back a little bit? Oh, here's the island. Yes, there's the island. We can look at that and then go back. And then um, many in the pottery area, it's quite a touristy area, especially on weekends when people go there because it's not too far from Bangkok. People go, so lots of food vendors and drink vendors as well. So with this group, we decided that we would again put the children into the four groups, quick introduction of the compass. And they had to brainstorm in their small group, Nature Economy Society Wellbeing, things that they would ask random people they came across when they were walking around the island. But we also had some pre-booked appointments with key people of the community, with um, uh, the medical clinic, government office, teacher, farmer, so that each group would, would have somebody that was planned uh, that they, they could interview. And then the plan was that we would mix the four compass groups so that each walking group had someone from the nature focus, economy focus, society focus and well-being focus for walking. And we then dropped the walking groups off at four different points on the island so that each group had about an hour's walk to do um, and collect their information. So as well as interviewing the, the identified people and random people that they came across, they also had a small uh, map of the island and they needed to mark on the map anything that pertained to their compass point. So if you were going through a very touristy area with lots of vendors, the factories, the pottery factory, that, that person would color, consistent color for economy on the map. And then they may create a symbol for factory and restaurant. Um, similarly, society would create a, temp, uh, a symbol for places of worship, places where people gathered, um, housing, residential areas like that. So the four groups in their mixed compass groups are dropped off and spend just over an hour or so walking around, interviewing, observing um, through their, their lens of the compass. So when they get to interview, and each group had just one or two people to interview, the questions were coming from different points of the compass, um, which didn't then just rely on one person generating the questions and the others in the small group being quiet more of the children were able to quickly be engaged because they had the responsibility for their part of the compass to share the information and gather the information that they needed. So then when we met the students back at the end, if we can move to the next uh, slide, we prepared a, a big, big base map um, of the island. And then if you move on to the, the next one, please, um, the groups then came and shaded according to whether the area was predominantly an area that was important for nature or predominantly an area that was important for economy or uh, well-being. Uh, and then you can see some strange symbols there. Whatever symbols they had for temples or houses or, or whatever, they went onto the map as well. So each group had a bit of time to put their symbols and to color the areas of the map that were predominantly um, to do with their compass point. And then the compass point people got together in common groups. So the economy people all chatted together and came up with the um, issues to do with pollution that they had seen. And what I found helpful with doing, talking about pollution through the lens of the compass was, how many times have you asked children, or, oh, you know, what's the problem with this area? And it's just pollution. And then you've got to try to unwrap, well, what makes, what sort of pollution? But because they've been thinking about pollution sources from the nature point of view or from the economy point of view, we didn't just get this blanket word pollution being talked about. The students were already saying, oh, well, actually, in the agricultural area, the farmers are applying chemical fertilizers onto their, onto their crops. So there's going to be runoff from the chemical fertilizer. And other children were saying, well, in the, in the um, economic area, 
the, there's a lot of dirty water created from working the clay. And there's a lot of motorbikes that meet at the pier and uh, where the ferry boats go across. So there's, there's a lot of noise pollution and there's a lot of um, particulate matter or dust coming out, fumes coming out of the boats and the, and the motorbikes. So the students were already aware that pollution wasn't this one blanket thing, that there were different types of pollution. And it helped them, I think, by identifying what was going on on the land to identify what the sources of the pollution were. And then we were able to say, well, if you, again, if you had to make some decisions or you had to um, have a campaign on Gotgret to reduce the pollution, what would the campaign be? And the students didn't have just one idea that was sort of a bit over everything because the nature people, they wanted a pollution campaign to stop the uh, artificial fertilizers going on the land. But some of the, the people who were in the ec more economic and the tourist area, they saw the problem of plastic bags, single use straws, things like that in their area. And they were able to say, oh, but actually we need different campaigns. So I think that the understanding of the issues of pollution were accessible to the students more easily by thinking about the different ways pollution could be generated through, through the lens of the compass. And then when we looked at the map and you could see some areas um, were very red colored and some were very green from the, the nature part of the compass, you could see that different stuff, the land of the island was being used in different ways. So when they took it back to school, I think they, they had a clear um, pictorial way of showing that actually land use is very different. There's different activities going on and within, within where an area that has a lot of economic activity, we've got different types of economic activity. So as a class, it was a great way for the group to work together as a whole group, but also in the space of, of their day with us to take something tangible back to school um, that, that showed the way the island was divided and that different parts of the island had different issues. Are there any comments or anything that anybody would like to add? Um, Linda, I noticed that some of your, your photos were of students who look younger. They look like perhaps they were in primary school. Right, Would yes, you if you want to go back to, to the little ones. Um, a little different, we've had like the age, you see the children walking across the bridge with the life jackets on. They're little, they're six, seven. Um, not with those particular children, but with that age, we had a trip that was about explorers, connecting to their, um, they had a unit on trade or traders or something like that, and they'd been looking at explorers. And... We were then explorers going up the river. And when we stopped at this island, we were explorers deciding whether we wanted to come and live on this island. So before we got off the boat and got onto the island as explorers, put it with our explorer hat on, we needed to think if we were explorers, what would we want to know about this island to make the decision whether or not we wanted to come and live here and bring our families and stay here. And so, you know, six or seven year olds, they say, are there animals there? So on our whiteboard in, in four sections like the compass, we put down animals. Were there birds? Okay, what food do people eat? Do they eat Thai food? So we've, we've, we've put those down. And as the, the children are giving ideas, we are sorting it for them into the four points of the compass taking whatever they say and not worrying about the labels of the four compass, but getting the four sections set up. And then um, I ask the children, okay, all these things here, like work and jobs and things people do every day, what could we come up with? What would be a title for that section? And they say something like work. Okay, work. So I don't worry about it being called economy. We call that for the purpose of today, work. And then what's the, what's the thing about animals and birds and insects and water? 
oh, that's to do with nature. So we've got nature. So we keep, oh, and then are we happy? Are we going to be happy to bring our family and live here? So we just called it happiness. Um, and the children went off doing very similar sort of activity, looking around with their iPads, taking photos of the plants and a domestic chicken that we've seen. So we know there's an animal and a dog, but it doesn't matter because we're getting them to practice the skills of being both an explorer, but also of observation, right? And really when we're taking children into communities, we're wanting them at whatever level and age group they are to be connecting um, at the level that they are and um, making sense of this place in the way that they can make sense. So then when we came back together as a group, um, the group that had been looking at jobs shared with us what jobs people had been done. And then we talked, what, how, what, what, what were they using in, in the pottery job? Oh, they were using clay. Where does that come from? Oh, it comes from the mud. So it comes from nature. So we were making connections the same, but we were using the vocabulary that the children have. Um, and I know that Compass colleagues use the correct terminology in their classrooms, and that's great. But remember when children come for us for a, a day, We've only got nine o'clock until three o'clock to send them back with, with something that they do. So if we're calling it being happy and work, that's good enough. Um, it's getting us to look closely at, oh, would we be happy here? Or would we be scared because there's a lot of dogs? And so perhaps that wouldn't make us want to come and live here, you know? So that's the sort of way around. Um, we've done this with the six and seven years, similar to the age you can see walking on the bridge. Okay, if you'd move us on, please. So my, my last uh, section I'd like to, to share is a primary year six type class who have gone with us to a fishing community. And again, there they were comparing is the fishing, what, what's special about the fishing community, comparing it with a Bangkok community that they'd already studied um, at school. So again, set out a brief introduction to the compass four groups that they've chosen where they'd like to, which group they'd like to be in, and then brainstorming for themselves things they want to find out. So no prompt questions, brainstorming things to observe or to interview. And I feel that then the kids are operating at the level that they are. They're motivated because they're finding out things that they want to find out. They're not just inquiring of a list that, that we've generated. And then when we go into the community, uh, an adult trailing each group and the group uh, going and finding people to ask people managing their nets or fishermen in the boats and asking them their questions and then using the, the, the area of the fishing village, observing what the boats are looking like, thinking perhaps some supplementary questions when they're seeing the, the environment. Um, finding out about why fish are on strings hanging on a bamboo pole, uh, the sorts of things that perhaps they wouldn't have any idea to ask questions about, but the fact that they've made uh, five or six questions as a group prior to going into the village has got them thinking about questions. And with primary children, um, usually we suggest that they have one where, what, why, when, who, how question, and they have one uh, prompted first word of their question um, to help them generate the questions quite quickly. I mean, if you do it in the classroom, you can, you, you've got time, haven't you, to, to make some brilliant questions and, and refine them and edit them. But again, we don't have that luxury. So for primary, it's just to give the prompt, okay, in your economy group, you need one question beginning with where, one question beginning with why, one question beginning with how, um, so that the children have got um, a, a scaffold, I guess, to help them get into thinking of their questions quickly as a group. So then after they come back from interviewing people and observing in the village, and they have the answers to their questions, um, with, with year sixes, there's some sort of play or dramatic presentation or a rap or something like that, that their group puts on that, that shares back their information. And then when they perform their presentation to the rest of the, the group, 
there's a competition that goes on to encourage listening. So while you're watching the, the drama or the rap or the, the mocked up interview that the children are rerunning of, of, of their experience in the fishing village, you have to be listening for something that connects to your point of the compass. And then when the presentation is finished, the hands are up for you to take the connections and give a point for each of the connections that people can find. Um, and then when we've heard all the presentations, we again, we try to see, can anybody make a connection between all four points of the compass? And then again, oh, actually it's all connected. It's a system, isn't it? What would happen if the numbers of fish continues to go down? Oh, so then we won't get so many fish when we come back from fishing. Oh, so that's going to affect the economy. And does that affect anybody else? Oh, society's hand goes up. Why does it affect you, society? Because we won't have money to mend our boat or to pay for our children to go to school. Okay, so well-being, does that connect with you? Or we'll be very stressed if we can't buy, send our kids to school or we'll be, we'll be anxious. Okay, so let's, that's, a, that's a negative everything's getting worse all the time. So can we think of a positive one? So in, in this community, the fishermen are actually quite actively involved in um, uh, crab conservation. If they, if they harvest a female crab full of eggs, they, they separate it and scrub the eggs off, rear the, the eggs until they are very tiny crabs and then put them back into the sea. So then we look at that as a system. Okay, so if now more and more crabs are having their, yeah, their babies released into the sea, what will happen? Oh, environment are pleased because the food chain is richer. There's more food at the bottom of the food chain. So the fish will grow and hopefully more crabs will also grow. And then they'll be able to fish more in the future and they'll get more money and they'll be, be able to build a new house and they'll be more happy. So we look at both a negative loop and a positive feedback of how things improve as we go around. And I think that, again, the students can understand the concept of everything being connected more quickly than if we were just walking into a village and they come back and they tell you, oh, yes, you know, they dry fish and they, they hang them on a string or, oh, there's crabs in that village. It's a richer sort of um, experience. And in a very short time, as a class, they've got a lot of knowledge about that community. And they're, they, they're asking things and then they're making connections with things that aren't just recalling the nets or the boats or the fish they're able to start handling some of the issues that are going on in that village and how um, changes in the population of fish is impacting or, you know, earlier this year we went and COVID um, has, has affected tourism in that area. And a lot of the fishermen have got uh, supplementary jobs in hotels. So it was really interesting for the children to hear how COVID, although they weren't affected by the virus a lot, the, the knock-on of not having the tourists and not being, not being employed for serving in the restaurant or washing up plates has impacted the community. Linda, and then you've, what, shared, oh, you've shared so sorry. many great examples with us, but we're nearing the end of our time. Um, yeah. So I wondered if you might have some time for a question or two before we yes, please, continue please to wrap up. Yes, please, please feel free to ask. Or share your, your own uh, experiences of children going into communities. I have a question about um, doing any of this virtually. Did you manage to translate any of these experiences into a virtual setting during, the, during lockdowns? Um, we created a program called Journey Through Thailand, 10 sessions um, that, that we've done with uh, we, we've delivered it three, to three different groups. And we were able to do something like the river observation. We showed a, a PowerPoint of, we actually had a little bit of video along the river near our office. And then we showed slides in a PowerPoint and the students did a river observation from the slides. Uh, and then we, they were in breakout groups is so that we had economy in one breakout group and nature in one breakout group. 
Um, we didn't make the connection circle, but we were able to observe through the lens from the photographs and we were able to discuss in our small group and then come back together and share. So but that's all we've done, but it, it was okay. I mean, it, it, nothing beats being in a community, does it? And that's the of whole course. purpose. But it yeah, was, of course. when you can't do it, it was better than nothing. Mm. Have you got experience and of that? Yeah, I was, I was curious also. That's, that's really helpful. Did you um, happen to... Like, did you have um, specifics in mind when you made the videos? Like you were trying to capture specific aspects or you just went through and... No, we just used our random pictures a little bit like I've pulled off for you of the ah. river, first of all. You know, things mm -hmm. that we typically see, th things that were on our computer. <laughs> that, right, right. That, that okay. we typically see. So, you know, the riverbank is, is, we're lucky. It's so rich. There's yeah, the houses, yeah. the temples, all of that. Then there's all the different boats that you see along the river. So different, different things like that. Um, we just had a hodgepodge of that. And because it was like a river observation, we it was random. We didn't have like a boat section and then a building section. It right, was all, right. all a bit random, like it is when you're really when you're going there. along looking. Yeah, yeah. And then um, one more question, if we have time is um, do have you considered creating like um, pre-recorded materials to send to a group that's going to come on a physical field trip with you so that they can be introduced to the concepts, like send it to the teacher and say, could you please <laughs> play these four videos about each accomplished point before we come or something like that? Or is that just not... Um, is it better to have them show up kind of fresh? That's that's a good idea. And it, it may work with some schools if you've got a teacher that has got enough time to prep with you. Or, I mean, we do sometimes go into school and do a session beforehand. But actually, I quite like them coming fresh because then you've got what the children have got in their head and you haven't got things a teacher's been feeding them. <laughs> you, you know Got it. and you you just are like excited because perhaps it's new and boom you you go with it usually the children come when they're studying rivers or studying water or something so they've already got some ideas um but I think for me I I don't think I need that prep done um prior to for, for a one-day trip if you were doing something perhaps that was leading to community service or you were doing something with that you needed more in depth, then yes, I would perhaps suggest a classroom session before. Um, but for our come and do and then run away again, <laughs> I think it's okay <laughs> just to, you know, be excited and boom with them on the day. Great. That's helpful, yeah. And also, sorry, one more question. Do do you um, do you know whether um, a lot of the groups end up um, working towards some sort of action or community service or engagement with the learnings that, like, if they say, okay, if we changed this one thing, it mm -hmm. would blah, blah, it would have this ripple on effect to the economy, the well-being. Do, do the students ever like, do that thing? Yeah, I, I don't know a lot of the follow-up that happens after they leave us. Um, okay. I do know that we had one year seven class that were looking at the problems of uh, uh, pollution in water. And then mm. they did some work on filtering water in different ways. And they okay. took that and they had quite an in-depth program about that. And they went back to one of the houses that was like a small uh, resort and they shared, they did a presentation with them, this is two or three years ago, they did a presentation with them about ways of managing the grey water from their resort to prevent the grey water going into the river. So I do know that one, but I don't know a lot of them. Um, wow, okay, very cool. Mm, yeah. Oh, thank you, everybody.
Yeah. Are we there with that time? We're, we're pretty much there with time. So I just want to say thank you so much, Linda, and for you for joining us today, everyone. Um, if you do want to learn a little bit more about community investigations, Linda is a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I want to point out that we also have a brand new quick impact course. So this is like a little self-directed two to four hour course, which Linda has taken a look at. A couple of our other educators have helped put it together and it pulls examples from educators around the world who work in communities. And this little course is all about how do you conduct a community investigation using the compass. And it has a bunch more examples and links to resources right on our brand new website, compasseducation.org. We've revamped it. There's new online courses. Um, such as that quick impact course and a brand new session of our teaching and learning for a sustainable world seven week facilitated course starting in June. So feel free to check that out if you want to learn more. Also going to highlight that we're super excited to have a brand new free introduction to the sustainability compass. So if you, it's targeted to educators, um, not at students, but if you Suji, thinking about your question, if you have teachers who you're working with and you want them to know the compass so they can maybe support you. This is an example of something maybe you could share with them. It's right on our website. So the teacher comes in with a little bit of understanding of the sustainability compass to support whatever conversations or, or projects you're going to do on a community investigation if you're working with a new school or not your personal students. Um, so, yep, that's wow. That's on our website. That's awesome. Yeah, it's brand new. The community um, the community course that was shown just a minute ago. Yes, community connections. Um, it, it's got some really great ideas and it's very user friendly. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just pointing those out and also highlighting in a couple of weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, in a couple of weeks, we will have another chat this time with one of our community members, Cindy Chen and three of our youth leaders who actually are connected to Linda and that they've all been leaders at our cycle camps, our Compass Youth uh, camp for leaders that we've hosted at the Tridos Three Generation Community for Learning in the past. So they'll be speaking in a couple of weeks about their experiences using systems thinking and compass tools to really encourage youth agency and action planning and projects. So if you'd like to join us, feel, feel free to shoot me a message now Very and I'll cool. just sign you up for it or stay tuned on social media to sign up. I, yeah, I will definitely try to beat at that one. I just have to figure out the times because I'm in yeah. in <laughs> um, Mexico. So it's just like super early. I completely <laughs> well, understand. Well, thank you, Suji, for getting up at the crack of dawn. <laughs> definitely. And yes, I'm, I'm also in the Western Hemisphere. So maybe we can time some of these better for, for Western Hemisphere in the future. <laughs> but okay, thanks so this much one was you. super helpful. Thank you so much, Linda. Oh, thank you, Suji. I hope that it just like sparks or adds to something you're already doing. Um, yeah, we do, we do very similar um, investigations in communities and we haven't used the compass yet but I really really want to start using it so now I got so many great ideas from you thank you oh I'm good let, let me know how it goes <laughs> okay super yeah thank you Doris too thank you Linda it was quite impactful great thank to learn more. Yeah. thanks so much enjoy the rest of your day everyone